Hello everyone, and welcome back to Realism Overall Sandbox, Synchrobol Space Program 1.8.1. In a recent video, I had discussed my three space plane designs and asked which one people wanted released. I released the Shinkansen space plane since it was the overwhelming favorite. But some people did mention the Orion 3 space plane. That is not my design, of course. This is not my design. This is uh, from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Let's go outside using hangar extender there. And the idea of this is that we have a space plane that is riding on the back of a carrier plane. The carrier plane lands uh, short of orbit. Of course, it's just suborbital while the space plane continues on to orbit. And actually, this is very handy. This is probably my favorite setup, uh, to be honest. But it's not my design. It's from 2001 A Space Odyssey, adapted as best I could, uh, given that we do need to take into account real aerodynamics, which is why the, the original Orion 3 did not have vertical stabilizers. Uh, this does, because we really needed those. So, yeah, some concessions to reality have been made, but overall it's a very good design. Uh, considering that it is from a fictional treatment, it is a very nice design. So, the thing is, we can launch, I think, and this is what I'm going to test in this video, any of my space planes on the carrier plane. Uh, the capacity for the carrier plane, what it's actually lifting here as far as the Orion 3 space plane is concerned, is 171 tons. The Orion 3 space plane has 4,478 meters per second to get to orbit, and it is 171 tons. You can see its thrust to weight ratio is 1.25, and the question is, whether I can actually launch my other space planes on the carrier plane, which will save me the trouble of trying Vulcan, which is annoying, uh, New Glenn, or SLS, or a whole bunch of other stuff, right? We've, we've gone through a number of different launchers for the ver various launch vehicles. Shinkansen, of course, launches with another Shinkansen, which barely gets to orbit. We can maybe get some more fuel if we launch it on the carrier plane. Uh, so, we're going to test all three out and see how it works, and also try to verify that the carrier plane still can land at Cape Canaveral if we're launching from Brownsville, because that is that turned out to be the ideal distance. If you want to, if you want to figure it out, the the maximum, the fastest that you can have a space plane carrier plane go and still survive is about 4,000 meters per second orbital velocity. So. A little bit less than that as far as the surface fixed velocity. And given that velocity, uh, where it's got to slam into the atmosphere and barely be able to survive, uh, the distance it's going to cover is going to be the distance between Brownsville and Cape Canaveral. So uh, it's good to launch it out of Brownsville, Texas and land it at Cape Canaveral. If you find two other locations that happen to be uh, that distance, they'll work, but of course you also need them to be east-west of each other, not, say, north-south, unless you're trying for a polar orbit. So, the orientation matters, too. So, this is a very convenient setup. Anyway, let's take a look at the first space plane, the Taurus space plane. Now, the Taurus space plane presents an interesting problem for us in that it's really, really small. It was designed to be small, minimal mass, for a large wing so that it can capture from a trip back from the moon easily so it can get back down to low earth orbit without too many passes and the problem is that it's a very light load and that leaves the carrier plane rather fast I mean we have to stop the engines when it gets to 4,000 meters per second so that means it's gonna end up being rather heavy potentially so we might want to underfuel it, so we have to see about that. In order to somewhat compensate for the lightness of the Taurus space plane, I decided to go with the Falcon 9 upper stage, and that's because it's not efficient. And <laughs> uh, in this case, being not efficient might be a good thing. I mean, not efficient compared to, say, a Raptor vacuum or a Hydrolox engine. Uh, this means that it's going to be relatively heavier as a boost stage for the Taurus space plane, but we still only get to 144 tons, whereas the Orion 3 space plane was 171 tons. So, yeah, there's a gap there. Uh, let's see what happens. Okay, so we've got Magsy and Newton in the Taurus space plane here. And we are just trying to get them to orbit. And then afterwards, we will test whether the carrier plane can land safely. So, 
ignition and launch so just a reminder the carrier plane has nine Raptor sea level engines on it so no fancy engines it's all methane and oxygen the carrier plane is meant to be automated because there's a lot of g-forces coming back down so we don't really want people on board <laughs> but I mean they could survive it it's just gotta be not nice uh, it's Yuri Gagarin levels of G's that they're gonna be pulling if they were on that so best not to be on that now the heading to Cape Canaveral is 75 degrees from Brownsville and we want a roll of 180 so this way we don't have too much additional inclination we're not wasting too much fuel the nice thing about the Orion carrier plane is that it can have this you know, re reasonably heavy load on its back and still maintain balance, right? It doesn't need the payload to ignite its engines or anything like that. It isn't even using much of its control authority at all. So yeah, this is actually the toughest one, I think, as far as getting the carrier plane back safely because the carrier plane will actually have more fuel than it needs. So if we can bring the carrier plane back safely after this one, uh, of course, we're going for orbit with the Taurus space plane first, but on the next launch, we'll try and bring the carrier plane back, and if that works, I'll be reasonably confident that the others, which are also lighter than the Orion 3 space plane, will also work. Since we know that this works with the Orion 3 space plane, that'll be the boundary cases. This one and the Orion 3 space plane itself. I think we'll try and keep it to 3G's for them. So I'll throw all down here. We roll over at 80 kilometers. We don't want to get too fast with the carrier plane. We also don't want to get too high. That's also a problem. Now the Orion 3 space plane managed to have a fairly high thrust weight ratio. This has less of a thrust weight ratio. Oh, uh, cut some engines for balance. Now yeah, we're getting close to where we need to shut them off, actually. Okay. Shutting, shutting them off. All right, separation. And. Ignition. Uh, direction, direction. Doesn't this have gimbling? I mean, what the heck? <laughs> anyway. Uh, alright. Well, we're using the RCS, it looks like. Uh, it's still not pointing where I want it to. Maybe it wasn't sure where I wanted it to go? I don't know. So you can't hold it without the RCS now? No, it's deviating. Interesting. Uh, maybe... Let me just verify it's controlling from the right place. Maybe this needs to be auto-strutted. I don't know. Yeah, one important thing for the stages that we put at the back of whatever space plane we launch is that they not be too wide, right? The diameter is not too much bigger than the space plane itself. Otherwise, the space plane's got to be suspended really high above the carrier plane and cause extra drag like that. And of course, the top of the tank of the stage is going to be a problem too for drag. This is a fully fueled Taurus space plane, by the way. Some of the other launches, like on the Vulcan rocket, we did not fully fuel it. It was only partly fueled. Of course, it being fully fueled is generally only useful for if it's going to be transferred to the moon or something. In this case, this does not have enough Delta V to do that independently, though maybe something could dock to the Taurus space plane when in orbit to boost it along. Well, so far I'm sensing no trouble getting to orbit here. We're just passing Florida. The cape is somewhere down there. 
we we're, it's wiggling for some reason. I don't understand why. Um, let's throw down here. Throw down. I don't know. The gambling on this has been really weird. Okay, that's a pretty good orbit. 239 by 235. Uh, the Falcon stage does have enough Delta V to deorbit itself if it has power and everything. Uh, let's see. Let's just make an effort here. Oh, don't toast the uh, Taurus. Okay. Ah, that's close enough. Okay, anyway, the point is that it works just fine. And we have 1,500 meters per second here, and it would be all good. So, now let's make sure that the carrier plane can land safely. All right, here we go again. Throttle up. SAS is on. Ignition. And launch. This is going to be interesting, though, for me, because I have to manually handle it all the way down. Technically, it doesn't have to be a dead stick landing. We do have uh, J-58 jet engines on it, as well as the kerosene for those. I'm pondering having a space program with just three launch vehicles. This, SLS, and Starship. One thing I learned while testing the Orion 3 system was that it's super important to make sure that the space plane is not in render range as we go along because once it explodes in the atmosphere, which it would if we are just following the carrier plane, uh, that causes all sorts of physics problems for the carrier plane. So we would we need to ignite that Merlin engine and make sure it moves along a bit. And shutting down and separation and ignition. Okay, so that's off. This, I don't know where it's con controlling from. Control from here? <laughs> Whoops. Alright, uh, we'll probably need this. Roll zero. Oh, I see some RCS firing. We don't need any engines on. We've got a substantial amount of methane and oxygen there. Probably 40 tons. Yep, it's out of render range now. That's good. Uh, so that's a lot. I might want to dump some, but I don't want to dump it such that we don't have any left because we obviously need it for RCS right now. So our current path is like this. You know, it seems to be falling short of Cape Canaveral, but we're going to bounce off the atmosphere a little bit. I shouldn't say off of, but just bounce up a little bit within the atmosphere. We're going to get some lift. But we're coming down very sharply here. This is where the G-forces come in. Okay, so we have entered the atmosphere once again. We're using some pitch authority here. It sort of indicates that the center mass is a little bit too far back. So here we go. Eight, nine ish, ten ish, around ten G's. And then we get lift here for a little bit. Looks like we need some more drag. We're Hitting the Florida coast here. Uh, yeah, 10 G's. Oh, well, there's the Cape. Still going awful fast though. And I might have pitched it up too much. Can't recover that. Well, we've got Mach 4 and we're not really slowing down here. I've got to try the air brakes. I'm gonna take some manual control, so atmospheric op- well, when I say manual, I mean fly-by-wire control. Okay, how far are we? Pretty far, but I think it's still manageable. Whoops. Okay, clouds. Wonderful. I see the runway. Get into the locked view. Landing gear down. 
Okay, coming in here. Okay, and we're down. Okay. Pretty gentle, except for the 10G part. You have to admit. Nothing too horrible with this. And sort of having demonstrated its functionality, I don't intend to land it every time, of course. We are just going to assume that it is possible going forward. Oh, it just did a glitch. <laughs> it just did a glitch. It just, just, uh, just to mess with me. Uh, you'll have to rewind the video a bit if you missed it, but it just, just randomly decided to hop up there for no apparent reason and cause one of the body flaps to be destroyed. It just, uh, just because this Kerbal Space Program. Anyway, so other than that, all is good. Let's try the other two space planes. Next up, the Shuttle Mark II. Now, in the case of the Shuttle Mark II, I had to make a custom stage. We're using BE-3Us here, so two of them like that. But the upper stage of New Glenn is too big, right? It's seven meters, so it wouldn't fit very well on top of this. So I decided to just make a procedural tank with the hydrogen and oxygen there. And we have 4,281 meters per second with it, which is less than what we had with the previous one and also less than what we have with the Orion 3 space plane. And that's because we are carrying, oops, uh, we, we're carrying all the fuel to transfer to the moon. So it's a lot heavier, but it's not heavier than the Orion 3 space plane. It's 167 tons or 169, one of those two. Uh, so yeah, it's much closer to the Orion 3 space plane than any of the other other versions. Okay, well, this is how the Shell Mark II looks on the back of the Orion 3, well, Orion carrier plane. I don't like to call it the Orion 3 carrier plane because uh, I, I want Orion 3 to be specifically the space plane. But anyway, it's all or this whole system. Whatever. Anyway, ignition and launch. There is a matter of whether the Shell Mark II can actually abort using its abort motors from this, given that that's supposed to be at the top of the stack and this would be a little bit dangerous. At least it's sloping down, but you know, at least it's not like a 747 with a hump on <laughs> the top standing in the way there, but you know, still, the launch escape system might not be the most perfectly safe system in this situation. And again, it's uh, 4,000 meters per second orbital velocity if you want to keep it to that 10 Gs. Still wiggling a bit though. Okay, separation and ignition. Is this going to be well controlled? We had some trouble without RCS last time. This seems okay. Better with two engines, I guess. Of course, one engine can't do roll, but I wasn't expecting... It was deviating in yaw and pitch as well, so that was a problem. We, as you can see, don't have a Delta V figure on the stage right now, and that's because of the abort system. So let's separate off the abort system. Off that goes. Oh, it really needs a little bit more separation force to avoid hitting the vertical stabilizer. Or sort of the V-tail, if you will. Part horizontal, part vertical. Well, looks good now. After separating the abort system, we've got good numbers and looks like we can make orbit. Still close. I mean, it's all very close, as always. Okay, shutting down early, so it goes down, and separation, and ignition. These are BE-7s. Any small Hydrolox engines would do. And so its internal fuel will be about 4,400 meters per second. 
So that's enough to transfer, capture, and hopefully return. Depends on what kind of orbit it's capturing into. Okay, that's good enough. It's made orbit and everything, so it works out. But tight, as you can see, we needed the, the Hydrolox engines to make it work out. Next up is the Shinkansen, which doesn't have a separate stage to uh, get it to orbit. It has to use its own internal fuel, and we'll see how that works. All right, last but not least, the Shinkansen on the Orion carrier plane. Uh, you can see the sort of scale of this. In this case, the Shinkansen has all of its fuel back here, so we don't need a separate stage. The carrier plane is, I think, about the length of a 747, so that's an uh, interesting way of thinking about it. But here we go, SAS on, throttles up, and the question here really is how much delta V does the Shinkansen end up in orbit with? Right now it's got an empty cargo bay, but if it has a lot of delta V once it gets to orbit, then that means we could actually carry some cargo in the cargo bay, unlike with the normal arrangement with the Shinkansen and the Shinkansen carrier plane, an identical plane that it launches with. And in that case, it really can't carry much extra mass, and it still needs boosters to help out. So anyway, ignition. And launch. Okay, rolling. And shutting off the oh wrong lane wrong, 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 wrong. okay uh, it turns out that I have action groups shared that's inconvenient <laughs> um, whoops those were the OMS engines on the Shinkansen I forgot about that okay balance is going to be tenuous pretty soon though. Uh, we can actually go ahead and light those and shut them down manually, I think. Not ideal, but forgot about that little detail. Let's hope it stops rolling around. Well, we'll have to take that. Alright, separation. And ignition. And we also have to extend the nozzles and make sure they're in the right mode. Okay. Hopefully not too worse for wear. 6,000 meters per second you can see it starts off with here. And a high thrust weight ratio at that so we can actually pitch down too. I mean, really, it's almost enough to transfer to the moon like this. Normally, we would have to bring up a hundred tons of propellant to fill it up. Now, of course, filling it up isn't what's necessary to transfer to the moon. Even with half tanks, it can get to the moon. Uh, so, But this definitely cuts down on how much we need to refuel it in order to make a lunar transfer and capture possible. Don't transfer to the moon without the ability to capture around the moon. Uh, but, yeah... Well, I mean, unless you're doing a flyby, I suppose. So yes, it's got lots of fuel left, which means it can carry a pretty good load in its bay if we decided to do that. So that's interesting. All right. 50 tons is really nice. Uh, but yep, so that concludes my testing this time. Can I replace all those fiddly little launchers with my Orion carrier plane? It's possible, it's very attractive, and uh, and it's reusable too, at the first stage at least. So, yeah, in this case, the whole thing would be reusable if I could safely return the Shinkansen, but that's always a little bit touchy. It's uh, acceptable flight envelope is really, really narrow. So, uh, for those of you who might have tried it out, you will have realized that it, it likes to be not happy with aerodynamics most of the time. So anyway, uh, that's usually after re-entry. That's when it gets to the thicker part of the atmosphere. But yeah, uh, re most of the re-entry, it's fine. But yeah, it needs some work. Anyway, so that was the conclusion of the testing. 
we can carry all sorts of things on that carrier plane and I look forward to doing so. With that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time.